Hi everyone, so today I just wanted to take a, a quick moment really just to discuss something that um, is born out of observations really. An awful lot of what we've been doing of late has been teaching wood carving, um, spoon making, cups, bowls, all that kind of good stuff and uh, I'm seeing lots of people coming onto the course um, with a bit of prior knowledge which is always good um, but I just wanted to kind of go through and take you through a few of my personal thoughts about knife safety, safe use of a knife. We would just skim over this, but I think we should talk about it. Firstly, UK knife law, what can and can't you carry in the UK? I would like to think that most of you at home could tell the difference between uh, carrying a 12 inch Cook's knife into Tesco's down the inside of your trousers and having an appropriate knife for camping out with the family uh, and, and, and using it responsibly, okay? So we think about our UK knife law, there's a couple of things to think about. One is the blade length, uh, the mechanism, okay, of how this thing opens and closes um, and, and the safe carriage and use of. So we think about people that use a knife every day, we think about butchers, we think about chefs, we think about carpenters, they use uh, edge tools or chisels and things like, all razor sharp bladed articles, technically in the eye of the law. However, a chef would roll it up in a knife roll, tuck it up underneath his arm or in his rucksack on the way in and out of the kitchen. Same with the butcher, he might even leave his, uh, his butchery knives in the shop up on a magnetic thing up on the wall out of sight. Um, there's ways and means of doing this stuff and what we need to understand is, is the law. So the law states that you can have a knife in the UK of three inches or less and it needs to be non-lockable. Now what I mean by non-lockable is um, Something like, if I just have a look in my pocket here, okay, I've got one of these classic little Swiss Army knives. Let me see if I can open this thing up. Excuse teeth, right. So, it's got a three inches or less uh, blade to it, but if I was to push this into a tree hard enough or onto, onto a hard surface or log, this would invariably slide round all of a sudden it has no means to lock or, or stay in position. So it's three inches or less non-lockable. Now, that said, I still have to have a reasonable cause to carry such a thing. Go back to our example, walking around Tesco's with a 12 inch Cook's knife down your trousers. What is the reasonable cause for that? However, we can then start to move into the realms of having a blade that is far larger than three inches, okay, um, and appropriate for its use, which is camping, bushcraft, and, and such. Um, it is, there's no locking mechanism here because this is one single piece of sheet steel the whole way through, it's a full tang blade. Um, so this would typically be put inside its sheath and kept inside my bag and out of sight until I get to the area that I'm gonna be camping or using to, uh, to whittle something or make something or reduce some wood down to make firewood or whatever it is I'm doing with it and then it's gonna go back and away again. So it's just about being responsible people, okay? So that's the kind of UK knife law in a nutshell. The next thing I wanted to really move on to was just a little bit about our anatomy, safe use of that tool, okay? And then the anatomy of the tool itself so that we can kind of uh, have best practice when, and be safe in the outdoors. So I am standing up now, I'm a white hairless chimp uh, in my kind of uh, makeup here. Um, I'm not particularly well uh, protected in my frontal plane, okay, my eyes, my neck, uh, underneath my armpits, uh, my stomach, my genitals, my arteries, okay, so I've got femoral arteries, brachial arteries running the inside of my, uh, my arms, I've got carotid and jugular. Everything's fairly vulnerable in my frontal plane. And actually, from an evolutionary standpoint, I've got rather poor field of vision as well, so I could be crept up upon by a saber-tooth moggy or something. So when we're thinking about this, um, I think about using a knife where we don't really want to be using a knife is probably between our legs, uh, hunched over in that frontal plane, okay? So the, the way I kind of advocate people using it is if you're right-handed, using it over your right-hand side, left-handed over your left-hand side. So let's have a little think about this now. Let's go through the anatomy of the blade itself. We'll whiz through this. I'm just gonna to point to some bits and run you through it. So this is the point or tip, okay? And we look at the, uh, the back here of the blade. This is the spine. What I'm holding now in my hand is the handle or grip. Now for the purpose of today, and for me showing you this stuff, um, this extended pommel 
is what we're going to go with at the base of the knife here. So this is the pommel and we think about handing a knife to someone safely, it's going pommel to person, fingers in a straight line, okay? So pommel to person. Now when we start to think about the actual design of the knife, most knives generally have a little bit of a, a guard here of some sort as well, depending on what the handle material is and, and their intended use. And when we start to look at the actual blade breakdown, uh, what I've got here is a Scandi grind, a Scandinavian uh, uh, beveled uh, edge, which means that where this ceases to become sheet steel and starts to become an angled tool, okay, for intended use in the outdoors, um, this is one solid angle. The whole way along, it's been put on a grinder and created to have the same angle the whole way along. This is great because it makes it easy to sharpen. Check out our video on knife sharpening and, uh, and that will take you through do's and don'ts of knife sharpening. Um, the entirety of the cutting edge is described as from the guard all the way up to the tip. So any part of this is going to be doing the business. So it needs to be uh, respected uh, as such when we're holding the knife. And the area where it ceases to be sheet steel and becomes the bevel, okay, that, that kind of raised ridge up here, this is known as the shoulder. So just to go through some absolute basics with you now, um, the first inch coming out the handle is known as the belly of the blade. Now it's with the belly of the blade that 90% of our work in the outdoors can take place. Now notice I'm right-handed, I'm working over my right-hand side, okay? And I can just literally, in a, in a standard grip like this, I could just push off with confidence, nice pieces, and keep turning this around. And if I, I guess if I was to keep turning this around, pushing, okay, and keep pushing and turning, I would then begin to start to make a nice pencil shaped tip to the end of this. As I move further up the blade, I'm having to put an awful lot more force in to achieve the same finish. Okay, so I've got more control, more power, right up in, the, uh, in here next to the handle and that first inch coming out. Okay, very simply, I mean, this is the beginnings of, of, uh, of making things like tent pegs and things like that, or sharpening a pencil in the outdoors, okay? So 90% of the work we tend to do is with that first inch coming out the handle. When we start to look at this curvature, okay, this comes into its own, much more advanced knife techniques. When we start to either hold the knife in the half choke position, so my thumb has come up, giving it the thumbs up, okay? And I'm gonna place something here in my sternum, and I'm gonna very carefully start to take off tiny amounts, shaving off tiny amounts back towards myself and then maybe back down this way, okay? So that's, that's a fairly good technique. Maybe if I was working on some, making something like a longbow or something like that, okay, something that's a bit more elongated, uh, that'd be ideal. The other technique is to fully choke the blade in my fingers, okay? And maybe if I want to create the neck of a spoon and just scallop out that little edge, okay? The force is actually coming from this hand up here, okay, the hand that was holding the piece. Okay, I've got these fingers that are free. So I can just place this up here using the right hand. I'm gonna go on this corner. I'm just gonna try and scallop out a little corner just to give you an idea. This finger is now pushing on the back and I'm merely scalloping out. You can actually make uh, a funky spoon uh, this way. You can take a piece of timber, square it off and you can actually make a funky spoon this way. It's really cool. Okay, so that's me being nice and safe. See how I keep turning it around and around, okay? And I've managed to scallop out this lovely shape here, okay? So that's without using a, a bespoke crook knife. The tip, or the very end, is usually reserved for work inside of a carcass. Maybe if I was trying to go around a, a ball socket or joint and take off the whole leg, I could lift up tendon and sinew. That's why this drops away nicely and keep that preserved for making things like fishing lines or cordage or things like that. Um, or maybe just cutting things in nice straight strips on a table like wet bark sheets in, in the springtime that we can then weave together to make baskets. Everything has its job and a role, but it's about doing that safely, okay? So in that position, I'm gonna be working on a flat surface or a log, uh, again, probably over my right hand side and away from myself. If I'm working with the knife, okay, I'm holding everything nice and tightly in here and I'm working off at this 90 degree angle. What I'm not doing and the thing I keep seeing is people putting, saying it's okay, I'm working over the top of my elbows. Look at my body. This is not, this is not a comfortable, I don't find this comfortable at all working like this. Because what, I tell you what does tend to happen, and it's more operator error than anything, is we start chatting away around the campfire on a course. 
And before we know it, we're right back here in that danger zone. And it only takes one person to come back in from having gone to the toilet or whatever to knock into you, bang, and you're straight into pretty much one of the worst places you could ever stick a blade. Now, on a slightly more serious note, I've had to deal with a femoral artery uh, for real in my past life. Um, it's not a fun thing, okay? It took 19 minutes for the ambulance to arrive. It wasn't on a bushcraft course, something completely different. Uh, and that person lost 49% of the blood in their body up me or the floor, right up onto the wall, hitting the ceiling. So that was a pretty traumatic experience. Having an accident with a, a razor sharp tool like this in a remote location, you've only got three or four minutes if you do spring a leak in an artery, okay? So this is why your first aid kit wants to be on point and your techniques, okay, need to be safe. So you wanna be using nice, good, safe techniques, okay? As well as pushing off like this, you could bring that thumb into play because of course I can't cut myself because my other hand is the other side of the piece of work I'm working with and you could maybe push off with the back. Okay, so lots of small movements. This is great for chamfering off the top of a tent peg. Check out our video on making tent pegs, okay, and you'll see an awful lot of these techniques coming into play. But I just wanted to take some time just to whip through some of those kind of classic do's and don'ts. So always make sure Whichever hand you're more dominant with, you're working over that side. Um, if you do start to get really tired and you're using the same muscle groups again and again, okay, there are a few other little techniques you can go to. Uh, turn the knife in your hand like a sundial to just past your knuckles. Bring everything in nice and tightly here and you're gonna use the muscles in your back, okay, as they contract using the belly of the blade again, as always, I can remove nice, great, big, powerful pieces of wood, okay? Now what I'm not doing is bringing the knife up here and sticking my nose down there to look at what I'm doing. Okay, it's all happening on this level here. And the knife's only going from here to here as I contract my back muscles. So this is good, safe technique. So there you go, be safe and go and enjoy the outdoors.